the Virginia Horse Industry Board, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. This week we visit Fauquier County and talk to Martha Bonetta as she continues her quest to protect the rights of Virginia's small farmers. Then Mark Viette has tips on preparing your soil when we go in the garden. We'll also have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. U.S. Tobacco Cooperative Incorporated has issued an announcement to tobacco farmers who deliver tobacco to the Flu Cure Tobacco Cooperative Stabilization Corporation from 1967 through 1973. During those years, Stabilization issued certificates of interest in capital reserve to its members who deliver tobacco. The U.S. Tobacco Cooperative is now offering to redeem those certificates, and growers may not need to have the actual certificates to accept the offer. Anyone interested in applying to accept the offer, including certificate recipients, heirs, beneficiaries, and estate administrators, can find an application form and offer details at TobaccoCheck.com. The application deadline is February 28th. Well, a big shout out this week to Marlena K. Preston for being named Virginia's Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year. Preston teaches kindergarten at Bellevue Elementary School in Radford. She uses agricultural concepts daily in her classroom as real life examples to demonstrate required curriculum. Her students have visited local dairies, farm markets, and Virginia Tech's horticultural garden. And she helped establish a school garden that is used as a teaching tool. As Virginia's AITC Teacher of the Year, she will receive a scholarship to attend the 2015 National Agriculture in the Classroom Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, and a stipend for her classroom. When it comes to beef cattle, they may all look similar, but as the American Angus Association's Cindy Campbell reports, it's important to treat each animal individually. No matter how uniform calves seem to be, each set is made up of individuals with differences. As we think about the last 30 years or 40 or 50 years in cattle production, we've created a sort of sense of if the calves off the truck all look alike, it's a good healthy group and we treat every sort of group of animals as if they're all equal. But there's a new school of thought and changes may be on the horizon. But the new future is about recognizing that off of every truck, even when they look alike, those animals are individuals and they have individual characteristics, both health and productivity wise, that we need to assess. That's especially important in today's market. When you superimpose the extraordinary value of these animals that we're seeing today, so you know, 12, 13, 1400 dollars for five, six weight calves, suddenly we're in a new sort of era. We have to ask the question and have the tools to answer the question, is that calf coming off the truck? Does it have a healthy set of lungs? Does it have a healthy digestive system? Does it have good feet under it? Should it get antibiotics or should it not? Because at the end of the day, treating the entire group as if they're equal goes against biology. From DNA to ultrasound, new technology will help uncover some of the differences. Currently, there's an eight second ultrasound scan that integrates data like heart rate and lung performance into an initial assessment, Sybil says. We're finding that animals with lung damage off the truck have a 50% higher chance of being the first animals to die with lung disease. Those kinds of technologies are allowing us sorting tools off the truck that's going to help us a lot going forward. No calf is created equal, and now prevention and treatment is starting to reflect that. I'm Cindy Campbell. Thanks, Cindy. 
Academy Award winning filmmaker James Moles feature length documentary Farmland is now available for rent and purchase via on demand platforms. Farmland, which made its theatrical debut in 2014, gives viewers a glimpse into the lives of six American farmers and ranchers. It was made with support from the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance and has received accolades from many leaders in the agriculture industry. You can view the official Farmland trailer at farmlandfilm.com. Well, Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe has announced the recipients of fiscal year 2015 Farmland Preservation Grants. Six localities have been awarded more than $1.5 million from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. The counties of Albemarle, Clark, Falkier, James City, and Stafford, as well as the city of Virginia Beach, will receive funds. The localities must use the grant monies to permanently preserve working farmland within their boundaries through local purchase of development rights programs. PDR programs compensate landowners who work with localities to permanently preserve their land by voluntarily placing a perpetual conservation easement on it. Conservation easements are a great way of preserving farmland, unless the powers that be exceed their authority. Now, as of today, a new bill is set to be passed to hold environmental councils accountable for the language in easements, basically to avoid a bait and switch situation. For example, trying to add value to a property by saying that Stonewall Jackson slept there without any historical data to back up that statement. Today we visit Martha Bonetta in Falkier County and find out how she is continuing her fight for the rights of small farmers. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. Today we're in Paris, Virginia, and we are on the beautiful Liberty Farm, and I'm joined by farm owner Martha Bonetta. And a few emu friends. And a few emu <laughs> friends. Yes. Thanks so much for having us Thank out you. today. Thank you so much for being here. Now, you've been a guest on our show a couple yes. of times, mm -hmm. but for our viewers who may not know who you are, give us a little bit of background about yourself and sure. how you came into the spotlight of farming. You know, I'm, I'm a native Virginian. I grew up in Mount Vernon. It was my childhood dream to be a farmer. And so around eight years ago, my family found Liberty Farm and uh, we bought it and we started farming. And I never dreamed in a million years there'd be so much regulation and red tape that would interfere with the ability to make ends meet and be viable on the family farm. And um, I had a birthday party for eight 10 year old little girls here at Liberty Farm. And uh, next thing I knew, I got a violation threatening me with $15,000 a day from my local county um, for having pumpkin carvings and advertising for pumpkin carvings in my pumpkin patch for the little girl's birthday party and for selling farm products on our farm. And from there really grew a statewide conversation and awareness about local family farms and the ability to engage in traditional rural agricultural activities and to do so without, um, you know, being able to farm without fear and being able to do that without the threat of um, over-regulation. And so um, it took two years and I'm just very grateful. Um, we had tremendous support from Farm Bureau and agribusiness and legislators and citizens from all over the state. I mean thousands of citizens became engaged from the farmers and the consumers as well. Um, both wanting to have access to locally produced foods and not wanting to feel threatened by um, too much regulation. In my case, um, they wanted to require site plans, special exception permits, administrative permits, full-blown hearings, and fees. And what the new bill does, um, the bill became law in July 2014. Our 72nd governor signed it into law. And what it does is it provides um, protection so that if you're on rural agricultural farmland and you're engaged in farming, that unless the county can prove that there's a, um, a dramatic impact on the health, safety, or welfare of the public, then you don't need to have all of the site plan special exception permits and administrative permits. And as you know, in Virginia, we're very blessed to be in a right to farm state um, that has such a robust and, and uh, blossoming you know, agricultural heritage and, and industry. Absolutely. And that bill was, I think, uh, justly named the Bonetta Bill. Yes, yes, it was so, named the Bonetta Bill. How did you feel? when they started calling it the Bonetta Bill. I, I was very humbled. I mean, I felt, I feel very blessed, very honored. I mean, just to have the opportunity to bring forward legislation is really, um, I mean, an opportunity that I never thought I would ever experience. And the outpouring of support, I'm so grateful. I don't know how I can ever thank everybody enough. Families took time away from work, from their homes, 
um, took time away from their responsibilities to come to Richmond, our, our state's capital, and to um, lobby and testify about how important this was to them. And um, to have been a part of that is, it's just been an amazing experience, and I'm so grateful to everyone, that, that, and to you, for having me on your show originally to be able to talk about it. Well, I think it's so important that uh, all farmers, and but especially our small farmers, have mm -hmm. protection that they need. A lot of the larger farms have protections under the companies they farm for, but the small farmers don't. And I think that's where your bill kind of beefed up the, the Right to Farm Act and, and really does help. Absolutely. Help and, and there's more of a demand now for locally produced um, farm goods than ever before. Farmers markets are popping up everywhere. There's a real, you know, awareness and desire to um, to buy locally produced, you know, farm fresh food, and also to uh, promote small family farms. And it, it's really exciting. Um, you know, the governor also has acknowledged a farm farmers market week in Virginia, and right. that's new. And um, and it's just been really wonderful to be a small producer and to feel like we're part of, you know, Virginia's number one industry, agriculture, and to be able to participate um, and 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 have that awareness. And it's just been it's been an incredible opportunity and experience, and I'm so grateful. Well, something else that goes along with this that happened recently that yes. I think is really neat is that Country Woman magazine named you one of the 45 most amazing women. Tell nation. us a little yeah. in the nation, yeah. the whole nation. Yeah. So tell us how that came to be. You know, I um, I got a call one day from the editor of Country Woman Magazine. She explained that um, Country Woman Magazine is a part of the Reader's Digest network. They have millions of um, readers and in circulation, and that they'd been around for 45 years. So this was their anniversary, you know, edition, and they wanted to honor and recognize 45 women that had. Um, but had inspiring stories that had contributed um, something to, uh, you know, the, 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 the country. And, and I was just so honored and humbled that they wanted to recognize me for um, the work that I did to help, um, you know, create the Bonetta Bill and make, it, and make it law. And I was just so humbled. And to get that kind of acknowledgement was like nothing I had ever dreamed possible. And, and I think it really speaks to how much, um, as a country, we really value uh, agriculture, we value family farmers and how much we want them to succeed and be viable and have opportunity. And, and to me, that's what it's a real testament of. Well, it's a great recognition. And I, I personally feel like it's one that's very well deserved <laughs> because you. you have been a champion for family farmers and for small farmers <sighs> throughout the state and ergo throughout the United States, Thank honestly. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. I never imagined in a million years that, um, that I'd be put in this position, but I think that it's, it, you know, they say it takes a village, and I feel like it's taken, you know, the hard work and the tireless effort and the dedication and the unshakable dedication of so many, so many people coming together and um, really working hard to, to, make, to make it possible for, um, for family farmers to be able to farm without you know, the threat of overregulation or being feeling like they're being overregulated off the land. You've been on national talk shows. Yes. You've really had a lot of exposure with this. In all, in all your goings on and your travels, what do you seem to think is the biggest misconception about United States agriculture today? Well, I think it's the, the image, the face of agriculture. Um, you know, it's no longer what, you know, the image that, that many people have of, of um, a man on his tractor and his overalls. You know, agriculture is, is a very, it's a diverse industry. Um, the face of agriculture has changed dramatically. So many women are, are farmers now and, and run farms and are producers large and small. And I think that um, that, that's, that that has always been a big misconception and, and more so today than ever before. It's, you know, farming embraces people from every walk of life. And, and to be able to witness that and experience that has been, has been an amazing journey. And, um, and it's wonderful to be a part of that, that changing, evolving face of, of agriculture. I want to talk a little bit about your farm. Um, we're surrounded by these beautiful birds, yes, these emus. They're emus. Um, what all do you have here on your farm? I mean, you're not yeah. a, a dairy farm. You're no. not a beef farm. You're not. Exactly. Tell us what, what you do on your farm. We're, we're, we're small family producers. We have over 285 farm animals. Um, we produce um, heirloom vegetables. We're mostly known for our tomatoes. People come from all over to get our tomatoes. Um, we also, uh, we have, of course, a variety of vegetables, but we also have an apiary. We produce raw honey, and we produce eggs from um, emus, uh, chickens, turkeys, ducks, uh, geese, guineas. 
guinea hens. So, wow. so we have a variety of eggs, and uh, people can come and interact with the emus and the chickens and uh, pick out their eggs. One of the one of the fun things we do is we let little kids just harvest the eggs themselves, right? Uh, which is an amazing experience that they would otherwise wouldn't have anywhere else. And uh, they're learning that this is where eggs come from. Yes, and one of the greatest joys of my life is to see them witness that. You know, eggs aren't all white in white styrofoam containers. They're blue and right. green and pink and lavender, and they come in all these different shapes and sizes. And just to see that wonder in them and that excitement is, is really very rewarding. And right. um, we also produce herbs uh, and hay. And okay. the fiber from our um, herds of sheep, llama, and alpaca. Well, I need to know how you manage your schedule. Because you yeah. are either in Richmond yes. working for a cause. Yes. You're here on the farm, yes. or you're traveling, doing interviews, and, yes. and other, how do you take care of your farm on this kind of schedule? Well, I'm really blessed and very fortunate because the General Assembly session is in my off season. So that helps a lot because we aren't, you know, we're not dealing with the harvest or planting um, uh, or maintaining the crops or anything like that. So, so that's a blessing. Um, and of course, you know, the beehives are dormant, so I'm not dealing with the, the beehives. It's, you know, family helps, we have friends that help, and then we also have somebody here on the farm that, that takes care of things for us when, when we're not here. I like doing most of it myself, um, so, you know, um, after session I'll be here all the time. Right. Yeah. I want to talk about a little bit about your legal battles. Yes. So all this, this whole Bonetta bill, everything came from legal issues. Are you in the clear now? Is I, are you, you know, finished? I wish. I wish. I wish I could say I was. Um, my family purchased this farm from the Piedmont Environmental Council, um, an environmental group. Um, conservation is a, is a good thing. I mean, I consider myself to be a conservationist, and it's an, it's important to the public at large, to our culture, to, to conserve and, and preserve. And um, so we purchased this this farm. Uh, it had been on the market for many years. And it was in it was in really horrible disrepair, and we fell in love with it. And I so much wanted to make this our family farm, and um, I didn't realize that um, you know the, these these conservation um, easements that are non-government agencies they have no transparency or oversight. And in my case, um, we ran into some problems where the um, Piedmont Environmental Council exceeded their authority, and you know really violated our rights, and and you know wanted to inspect our closets, um, stood on our chairs to look in attic space, oh, you know, um, took pictures of my laundry, uh, really, really just really abusive things, you know, the, that, um, that have nothing to do with conservation or the environment. I mean, what I have in my closet or my drawers or my cupboards or what laundry I have is, is beyond the scope of what um, anybody from, from the Piedmont Environmental Council should have been doing on our farm. Right. Yeah, and um, and so um, what I realized that there was nowhere to go, short of litigation, and you know, as a society, as a culture, we should embrace conservation. It's a good thing. Absolutely. And absolutely, and and it's supposed to be a win-win for everybody. It's supposed to be a win-win for for the state, for the conservation holder, for the farmer or the landowner, and for the public at large. And what had happened was, it it had become a lose-lose for everybody, because um, short of litigation was forcing families into litigation. And so it was really important, I thought, to have a venue, somewhere where a family could go, a farmer could go, a landowner could go and say, I, I'm, you know, there's a little bit of, it, you know, it's a little confusing, can you help me out to figure this out, without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation. Um, and, and so what we have now is House Bill 1488, it's going through the General Assembly, it's before the Agriculture Committee now, and um, what it does is it, it provides a voluntary basis um, if there's a question about, you know, you know, can I put my chicken coop here? <laughs> yeah, right. can I put my fence here? Um, without having to, you know, uh, go beyond just an informal environment where you can, you know, ask a question, it provides that opportunity. And it, and it does it in a way that's informal, non-binding, um, that, you know, really can help. I think, it, I think it strengthens the conservation program because it makes um, landowners feel like they have somewhere to go. Over 5,000 Virginians signed this uh, petition uh, wanting this, this, this law, this bill to become law. Wow. And we have bipartisan co-patrons. And again, there, there's another example where I, I feel very blessed and, and honored to witness how important um, we as Virginians, as Americans, value our family farms and how much we want to do everything we can to protect them. And, and to be able to witness this in this process again, it has just been such a blessing. I'm so grateful. 
Well, good luck. And thank you so much for having us out at your gorgeous farm today. <laughs> thank Even you. though it's freezing cold yes, out here. Yes, yes. But we really enjoyed being here. Thank you. And the emus joined us too. I think so they did. Great. I yeah. think they did. <laughs> thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be right back. When it comes to growing plants or flowers, the right kind of soil makes all the difference in the world. Today, Mark Viette shares tips on preparing that soil. Let's go in the garden. When plants die in your garden, what do we all do? We blame ourselves. I have to tell you, it's not your fault if plants die in the garden. What I find is many of us are dealing with imperfect soils, heavy wet soils, clay soils, or soils that have been compacted by bulldozers, heavy equipment, to the density that's harder or thicker than concrete. And so our plants don't thrive. But there are a lot of things that we can do to improve our soils. If you have poor soils, within three years, you can have a perfect environment that will help your plants grow year after year after year. Be it trees, shrubs, flower gardens, annuals, or vegetables, there are a couple easy steps that you can do right in the beginning that'll ensure your success. I always like to have a nice, loose soil. So let's look at some of these things that will give you that environment for your plants. Have you ever heard a $10 hole for a $2 plant? Well, there's a reason for that saying. It's really important that you prepare the soil even before you think about what kind of plant goes where, because that's the most important factor. A lot of us are dealt with a given soil like this, which, you know, these make great mud balls. You know, they don't crumble. They make nice round balls. And if you actually threw this against a, a block building, it would stick to it. That really isn't healthy for a plant environment. What you really want is soil that crumbles. And when you work the soil, it's important that it's not too wet. Because once you do work your soils, and you compact them, it could take five years or longer for air and water to penetrate that hard pan that you created within your garden. We have taken all the soils around the home that were like this, heavy clay, in some areas very red clay, you really had a hard time digging, and we have made those soils now look like this. And there's a couple things that you can do. You can add compost, you can add organic fertilizers, and you're also going to have to get a workout. Watch this. Are you ready for your workout? It's this simple. Just take organic matter, and if you have your own compost pile, that's great. I suggest about two inches of organic matter over an area that you're planting. In addition to that, use an organic fertilizer like Plantone. Always read the label directions. I also like to use a mineralizer like green sand. And the term double dig is you're going to dig it twice. By putting it on first, I'm going to mix it in by doing this. And you just work the soil. Two times. Then you're going to go deeper. And you can see some of that clay coming up. And I'm digging down to about 10 to 12 inches deep, probably deeper than a rototiller. Once you're done, you're ready to plant and enjoy your flowers, trees, shrubs, or vegetables for many years to come. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, the Mid-Atlantic Junior Angus Classic will be held March 13th through 15th at the Rockingham County Fairgrounds in Harrisonburg. This is one of seven Junior Angus shows the American Angus Association sponsors each year for its nearly 7,000 active Junior Angus members in the United States. For more information, visit the web address on your screen. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a fantastic week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. 